things. I, I, I'm very passionately Northern Territory, and I'm going to talk about the Northern Territory at times. Then other times I'm going to talk about Northern Australia, and if, if I sound like I'm confused, well, sometimes I am. But anyway, I think it's all the same thing, but I'm going to intermix it a little bit. But what I'm going to propose is that it's, it's not about Northern Australian development, it's about Australia's development. And if we don't view it like that, uh, we're always going to be seeing it as some sort of a competition. Um, so it's Australia's imperative to develop Northern Australia, and I'm going to... Sorry about the green lights, if anyone got them in their eyes then. Um, and I'm going to propose that um, if we don't do that, uh, we're not going to see Australia's potential developed. We're not going to see that Australia's um, future in the region anywhere near it should be, uh, and it's not going to be good for the future generations of Australians. So I ask the question, first of all, what is important to us as Australians? What do we see as the important things? Now, I'm going to ask those questions. I'm going to probably start answering them. But I think these are the questions that everybody has to ask as Australians, as Australians in a region that is taking off when Australia is going backwards. Is it about food? Is it about those basics, about food, shelter and, and procreating um, for the next generation? About lifestyle, some of the luxuries? Is it about security? And I talk about international security, global security, regional security, prosperity, influence. Um, is it about participation and growth? And is it about being whole as a country? So they're the questions I think I ask and I think Australians need to ask. So developing Northern Australia is a misnomer is it implies a lot of things. It, it implies a division between North and South. It implies a division, as we talk, seem to talk all the time about divisions between one sector of the Australia and the other, about one ethnic group and the other, but one region and the other, rural, urban. And I heard somebody at lunch talking about the fact that people are still talking about the rural-urban divide. So it implies some sort of division. Now, if if some of the work that's been done by esteemed economists has anything, um, anything to tell us, the boom that we had in the, in the last 10 years or so and the productivity gains that we made in the um, 90s and 80s have started to evaporate. The um, total living standards of Australians is in decline at a time when the rest of our region is increasing. Now, that's a big change. We've had a, a period of absolute boom, and we're now entering a period where things are going to change dramatically for Australians uh, in a, at a time when the rest of the world uh, is moving ahead, and certainly our region. So depending who you look at, we're certainly in the G20. Depending whose statistics you look at, we're in the top 20. But in, you know, there's a whole range of different measures uh, of what your economy's size is made up of, but we're in the top 20 in all measures. And we know that the 10 of the top 30 economies in the world are in our region, they're our neighbours. And we know that Australia is exiting that top 20, and there's various predictions about when that'll happen, but we are exiting. And at the same time, our neighbours are entering and rising and increasing and bringing with them, with their economic ranking, bringing influence, bringing security, bringing them standing and economic power in the region. So there we are. Now you can cut and dice this whichever way you like, really. But that region there has, they say, half the world's population. Jamie was talking about India and talking about China and talking about Indonesia. Well, that encapsulates those countries. We also know that you can cut and dice the tropics as well, and there's about 50% of the world's population in the tropics. The north of Australia is in the tropics. So whichever way you look at it, Northern Australia is part of the action, it's closest to the action, uh, but what are we doing? Um, we're in a neighbourhood now where um, we're seeing a transformation in the Asian countries to our north. We're seeing a transformation from rural to urban economies. We're seeing a transformation in agriculture as a result. We're seeing changes in strategic positions and posture from America, from China, from Australia, and from those emerging countries in the region. And we're seeing a massive change in consumer patterns and trends, which has been driven by money, it's been driven by education, it's dri been driven by sophistication. Oh yes, sophistication. 
and by specifications. People want good things. They don't want rubbish. They want good food, they want safe food, they want good clothes, they want good cars. And economies of Asia now are leading the world in the tech boom. Countries like, uh, like Korea, who for all intention and purpose have very small resource base, but are leading the world. And we're also seeing in those countries transformation of agricultural sectors, so we cannot assume that because we are good at what we do now that we'll be good at it in 10 years or 15 years, that producing safe, clean food will be food that people will want in Asia in 10, 15 or 20 years, because you can bet your bottom dollar what we do, someone else will learn how to do. If we're doing it well, someone else will learn how to do it. And we will miss the boat. The most important thing, I think, is that we are not dominant at, any, at everything. We're not dominant at anything, in fact, if you really cut and dice it. I often see this attitude that we're a dominant culture. People don't say it, but they act it. They act it all the time. We look down on people in, to our north and consider that we in some way are a dominant culture, culturally, economically, in a whole range of ways. Well, I can tell you that is the furthest thing from the truth uh, that exists. The previous slide I talked about, so I talked about their sophistication. Go to a country where you can go at 400 kilometres an hour on a train that doesn't, actually doesn't touch the track. And you can stand up and you walk around in that train and you can go around corners and you can still walk in that train and you don't fall over. And the train doesn't fall over, it doesn't rattle, it doesn't bang. Now that's, that's high tech. And we're in a different world. And if we think we can just continue to sleep it off but stay relevant, well, I tell you we've got something else coming. And I think if Australia and the North doesn't engage, we have that risk that we will just sleep it off and we'll wake up and we will say, what happened? We are no longer relevant. We're a great place to live, great place to visit. We've got some wonderful things to see. We produce some good stuff from time to time. We only feed 40 million people outside Australia. It's a couple of cities. But, you know, it's a great place. But the world's left us behind. So we know that if we as Australia needs to remain relevant in the world, in our region, we have to stay in the space. We have to stay economically engaged. We have to stay engaged so that we have all the other things that come with economic prosperity. It's influence, political influence. It's strategic influence and capacity to maintain our place in the world and maintain a future for our kids. So just a bit of background on Northern Australia. Um, that map has been used and it's now I'll slip back to a, the fact that did I say I'm a public servant? Um, I don't think I did, but I'm now a public servant. I was, I was uh, they call them fat cats. I remember when I grew up, people used to call them fat cats. I'm not sure. I say that sometimes and people look at me really strangely. Um, so I'm not sure it's a term that people use much anymore, but I'm one of them. Anyhow, um, this was a map that was drawn which is fundamentally along the 26th parallel, along the tropic. And we've got, can anybody tell me what that city over there is, on the, or town is over there, anybody? Who? That side, Western Australia side? Sorry, I was too, sorry, over there. Carnarvon, good, other side? Vegas, Rockhampton. Alice Springs in the middle. Um, and there are the major cities of southern Australia. And we've got 22 million people living down there. And we've got 1 million people living up there. We've got 10 politicians up there. And we've got 150 down there, down here. That's the equation. And that's the equation which drives so much of what happens. It's about influence. It's about relevance. It's about understanding. And it's about believing in a future. And we're trying to move trying to move Canberra, sort of up there somewhere. We reckon Canberra would be good about there because that would mean that the bureaucrats that are driving policy at the moment would actually understand what happens above that line. But we keep trying. So it's the place in the region as well, and that slide previously gives you an idea of the fact that we are... Whoops, 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 sorry. We are closer. We are closer to these major cities than we are to our own cities. Uh, Singapore is about the same distance as Melbourne. Uh, Jakarta is only a couple of hours away. It took me four hours to get here last night um, through Sydney and Melbourne. So we know the history of Northern Australia. We know the history of Northern Territory. Um, you know, it goes back a long way. 
uh, sort of white fella terms, it's much shorter, obviously. Captain Cook came and, and New South Wales was part of the Northern Territory. Is that a ding? Halfway. Ten minutes. Uh, Northern Territory is part of New South Wales. That's too much, too hard, too big. South Australia had a crack at it for a while. Then they got a bit too hard for them and they gave it to the Commonwealth Government and the Commonwealth Government said, you can have it in 1978. Here we are. Um, but the region, Northern Australia, Northern Territory has, has long-standing relationships in our broader region, culturally diverse, culturally embedded in the, in the Asian region. Low population, low representative base, which we talked about, 30% Indigenous population, 3% in the rest of the country. And that's pretty consistent across Northern Western Australia and Northern Queensland. 40% of the land mass, I think it's more, more like you said 46 this morning, I think. But anyway, well, just shortly, a little while ago. Um, quite a bit of Aboriginal land, varying tenures across Queensland, Western Australia and the, the Territory, range between 15 and 50%, depending on the jurisdiction. But it has some specific characteristics that also set it apart. Low rates of infrastructure investment, public infrastructure, infrastructure which enables the economy to move. It is effectively a developing country within a developed country. And that is the thing that I think we often misunderstand, don't understand, don't get. Uh, and it is strategically important, always has been, but increasingly strategically important. It has location, it has proximity, and it also has practice. It has attitude, it has practice, it has outlook. It knows what a lot of the rest of Australians don't know. And that's what we have to change. So some of it's about chickens and eggs. And we always hear the chicken and the egg thing. And this is a no better example of the chicken and the egg. But the, the other thing is that it really requires leadership and it requires courage. And there's been leadership. There's been courage. There's been four or five reports over the last 120 years about Northern Australia and the prospects of Northern Australia. But a lot of this is cyclical. And it's about people, it's about population, infrastructure, investment, development, markets, market-driven, conviction, policy, intervention, in those orders sometimes, not in those orders. Population drives investment in infrastructure. Infrastructure drives, drives population growth. Some of this is chicken and egg. And when you have a low population base, the economic arguments don't always stack up. But we do have underutilised assets. We've heard that this morning. We have an outlook on amazing markets to our north and we have relationships. So I think as long as those assets aren't fully utilised, Australia is going to be worst off. Now I'll give you an example, an infrastructure example, and I'll make no apologies, this is about an industry that I, I dearly love, and Georgia spoke very passionately about it just then. But this is a, 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 an industry which keeps it simple. It's about photosynthesis, grass, sunlight, rainfall, animals eat the grass, they turn it into meat. Now, we do that well. We have a market. This is just one particular market. Uh, Mr Nolan's up in the crowd there, and I, I know that he, he does things with it here and sends it away. Other people send it away like it is. But this is about a market, having a clear line of sight to a market, to a consumer who is changing. That consumer is changing, becoming more sophisticated. Whatever the product is, whether it's a service, whether it's food, whether it's products, you have to have a clear line of sight to your market. Sophisticated, unsophisticated, but it is becoming more sophisticated with time. We have willing people who are good at what they do, have the infrastructure in some cases and the capacity to do it. They have the will. They have the expertise. Uh, that supply chain is only as good as the weakest link. And that is what brings down the standard and capacity of an industry to prosper. It also discourages investment locally and internationally and you're only as good as your weakest link. Running seasonal business is not going to be good enough in the future. You're not going to be able to compete and develop the high levels of sophistication that we require. So how do we judge infrastructure investment in the north? We do this thing called cost-benefit analysis. Now, there's people who down, live down here who are very well-meaning people, and they look at their point of reference is this part of the world, highly developed urban and rural infrastructure, plenty of choices, plenty of roads, plenty of bitumen, Generally, the weather's pretty good, generally. And they apply those principles to the north of Australia. Now, that map's reasonably descriptive of the infrastructure that's there. The Territory alone, there's 80% of the, the roads are unsealed and they're seasonal roads. So you don't have the choice. You don't have the capacity to do the things you'd like to do in a lot of cases. But we use this thing called cost-benefit analysis and it goes in a little, a little machine and they go, we're going to put a dollar in and we're going to see how many dollars we get out in economic return tomorrow, very quickly. And we'll make our decisions based on that. Well, I'm sorry, that doesn't work in Northern Australia. 
we have to be much broader in our judgment of what the benefit is. And it has to be far-sighted. It has to be looking at what the future potential. It has to be looking at what can happen if you truly invest and you have the balls to do it, the political courage to do it when there's only 10 seats in Northern Australia. But you have to understand that if we don't do it, it is our children in Southern Australia who will also be sliding down that slippery slope of Australia's influence in our region and in the world because it's about, some of it's about economics. So the one size fits all. The, the um, cost benefit analysis has to be developed further. We have to look at other ways of valuing infrastructure investment in the north to develop that courage to do it and allow politicians to believe that it's a good thing to do it and that they can argue the toss with their people in their seat down here that it's a good thing. It's good for your children, it's good for the future. Um, and that infrastructure has to be linked, it has to be far-sighted and we have to focus on not just economic infrastructure but social infrastructure to build sustainable communities and sustainable um, environments for people to live in. But they must have a bigger vision. Um, you know, people come into the north with, I am amazed at the vision that people have when they come to the north of Australia and talk about what you can do with the port of Darwin that is connected with rail, with road to the rest of the country. Now, some of these people come from a country where infrastructure development has just really gone off the dial in the last 30 or 40 years. But they can see the potential to provide a gateway in and out of Australia through the north of Australia. So you don't have to break down ships in Singapore. You can bring a, a large ship in and you can distribute to the rest of the country out of the north of Australia. Save eight days in transit while ships going around, around about. People with amazing vision because they've seen it happen elsewhere. And that's what we often lack. And that connectivity of infrastructure. So if we can put a railway link from the Northern Territory's Northern Line across to Queensland, what's that going to do? What's that going to do for this part of Queensland? What's it going to do for our capacity to move goods from the eastern seaboard into Northern Australia and vice versa? Because everything we produce generally has an input that has to come in as well. People are paying effectively four times the price for fertiliser once it hits the ground per unit of production in Northern Australia. Why? Because it costs twice as much because you bring it in by road from Queensland. You use twice as much because generally you're, um, sometimes there's more volatility in relation to the environment and you're using more. People are paying up to four times the amount of fertiliser, one input. And that's about your capacity to be able to bring things in for your business and get things out every day of the year. Now, we can go and look at gas infrastructure, for example. This is a, this is a stylized map. That's a rail corridor and potentially a gas link into the eastern seaboard. So that you join the northern gas network with the eastern and southern seaboard. Those cities are on fire, by the way, because apparently New South Wales is running out of gas, we've heard. We have 300 trillion cubic feet of gas underground in the Northern Territory. That's bigger than anything off the northwest shelf on the Timor Sea. And the industries that flow from sometimes connecting up and exploiting reserves in the right way uh, can do a lot. So, we've got a range of things in the north. We've got a clear line of sight to consumer. You have to have a clear line of sight to consumer, the ultimate consumer of your product. A good policy, trade relations, strategic position is critical, diversification, we've heard Georgia talk earlier on about diversification that has increased uh, on pastoral lease, but fundamentally most of the land in the north is tied up under pastoral lease or Aboriginal land, which is largely inflexible in relation to the then reuse of those resources. We have to have adaptive and innovative water policy. We have to be able to look at other things other than just building big dams, because we know that you lose five to six uh, metres of water every year through evaporation. There's a few good dam sites, but we have to be creative about how we use water. And I think Twiggy Forrest was talking earlier on about using underground water more effectively. The Ord River does about $100 million worth of agricultural production every year. The Greater Darwin area does $200 million, and ostensibly you don't know it's there. It's embedded into a rural, semi-urban environment, uh, and it uses underground water. It's ostensibly you don't really notice it's there. So it's horses for courses. And the thing we know is that we have to be producing a premium product. If we're not, we're out of the game. And if we don't have a clear line of sight to consume and reverse engineer the markets and produce something we know is going to give us the return we need, well, we're going out the door backwards before we start. And I'm glad Michael's here because the Northern Research Development and Adaption 
dot point there is about how we develop Northern Australia with a Northern mindset. Not with a Southern mindset, not with a European mindset, not with a Mediterranean mindset, which has happened too many times in the past. How do we de truly develop innovation that is based on the North and the specific characteristic characteristics of the North? That's why Grow North has to be, if it's not, it can only be because there's a lack of conviction to the North and a lack of commitment. It has to fly. It has to fly as a new model to drive real innovation. Did you hear that, Craig? Got it. OK. <laughs> so anyway, we have to engage the northern population. That graph I put up very early on showed us productivity and participation in the workforce. Without increasing the productivity of our workforce in Australia, and we can argue that northern Australia is even more critical, we are not going to lift our economy and lift the good of the country as a whole. We have to increase the productivity of our workforce, of our populations, and in the north of Australia that is also a critical component. We have to build social infrastructure to keep people, to attract people, to want them to stay, educate the kids. So the kids aren't going to be disadvantaged going to school in the Northern Territory or Northern Australia because over some other kid who's had all the best stuff down south, people are going to want to stay there because they know there's a future there. And we have to, as is happening, has been happening, but we have to increase the flow of people within our region. The sharing of culture, skills, education, and grow those relationships further in our region to remain relevant. So we've got to do that in a balance. And, and look, there's, there's a lot of people, that word development scares the living daylights out of them. And travelling around the country, it's quite across the board. People are concerned about a word called development because they think it means you're going to lose something. It's the expense of something. That is what we need to ensure that happens, is it's done in a balanced way. We preserve and nurture what gives us our competitive advantage, what gives us our uniqueness, and what gives us that special bit that's about Australia, it's about Northern Australia. Because that, at the end of the day, is what we have to preserve. In doing that, we have to manage the resource extraction, we have to manage the resource exploration, we have to manage the relationships of landholders, we have to respect those that are going to be there for a long time, not a short time, and we have to do it with the future generations in mind. The traditional industries, the growing industries, the new industries. Thanks, George. That's one of George's photos that went into a uh, photo competition. Can you tell us about that particular bloke riding the horse? He's from Holland, wasn't he? Tasmania. Almost. Oh, sorry, Tasmania. <laughs> Tasmania. And the other area I think that we often forget is the strategic importance of Northern Australia. And some of these things are starting to converge. America is changing its posture in the region. China and a number of others are changing. And the North is becoming increasingly important for the Australian defence stance, but also internationally. You start mixing some of those things together, and you do that the right way, all of a sudden you start seeing the shape of Australia changing, and changing for future generations, uh, preserving what's good, nurturing what's good, and maintaining our competitive advantage. Um, and I maintain that this should not be a competition. If it comes down to a competition which it has been for the last 150 years, Australia will lose. And as soon as that fact, I think, gets through, the better. This is not lose-win. It's not win-lose. It should be win-win. And if we look at it like that, the bucket is too big. The opportunities are too large to be competing with one another. Um, and the task is too big. And at the end of the day, those kids and their kids and their kids are the ones that we need to be thinking about. So that's it, Michael.